This is Heute van Hoytema on the Cinematography Podcast. The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey there, Ben Rock. Hey, Ilya Friedman, what is up? <laughs> It's another episode of the podcast. And uh, who's on the show today? This is a big one. This is one we've been wanting to get for uh, for a long time. Hoyt von Hoytema, DP of Oppenheimer. And we pretty much only talk about Oppenheimer, but my God, I could talk to this guy for five hours about Let the Right One In, which is the first movie of his that I ever saw. I, I know you could because you were such a massive fan of that movie. So Was uh, and am. His work is amazing, though. I mean, look, look at his entire filmography. He's been working a lot with, with Christopher Nolan. Basically, after Wally Pfister stopped shooting for Christopher Nolan after The Dark Knight Rises, Hoyta has shot every single Christopher Nolan movie, but he's also shot some pretty noteworthy films, including uh, Nope, the Jordan Peele horror movie that I also love. Oh, um, I would have... I sh- I- Darn it. Spoiler. I didn't ask him if the character of the DP in Nope was based on him. (laughs) (laughs) It's a joke. I'm sure it wasn't. But he is a great character. He's one of my favorite parts of that movie. He's he's a great character, but I I don't think it was, I mean, based on talking to Hoida, I do not believe. I was making a joke. I I have some theories about who it might be based on, but I don't want to piss anyone off. So I'm not going to say them out loud. (laughs) Uh, Because we still want them on the show. That's true. And now, Close Close focus. Focus. All right, so Ben, it's a bit of a grab bag this week of stuff. Um, the Super Bowl happened. Yeah, yeah, we were talking about yeah the the, the Super Bowl, and the problem is that uh, I uh, don't watch sports on television. I just don't do it. I'm sorry, and I'm not here to yuck anyone's yum. If you like watching the Super Bowl, you know, obviously I'm in the vast minority here. I just don't enjoy watching sports on television. Well, there are still more people on the earth who didn't watch the Super Bowl than did. So you are in the majority in that department. But as far as Americans who have household television, yeah, it was like 123 million people who watched it, which is the highest telecast of anything ever, like short of the moon landing, which was screened, you know, all over the earth. So yeah, that that's that's a that's a big deal. That's a lot of people now, watching. How the, many the how many of those millions of people do you think Taylor Swift was responsible for? <laughs> I mean, even if it was only five million, that's still impressive. Yeah, it's possible. I think there's probably a few people who did tune in to see the cutaway shots of you know Taylor uh, rooting from the stands. It could, it could well, happen, I do yeah. think that. Um, the Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey thing is uh, sort of the soap opera of, of this uh, Super Bowl of this year. There was a right wing conspiracy that, you know, Taylor Swift was going to like jump up after the game was over and endorse Biden. Did you did you hear about that? Well, yeah, that, the, in, in general, yeah, because I, I guess at one point she encouraged her followers to register to vote, which I don't I don't think is a bad thing for even someone who let's say someone whose politics I disagree with, like Kid Rock or Ted Nugent. If they want to encourage people to vote, I'm, I'm all for that. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I, I just think that uh, conspiracists going to find conspiracies wherever they look. Here's where I land on that. I already mentioned my antipathy towards televised sports. And also, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, like we've, yeah, we've talked a lot about Taylor Swift on here. So to me, it's like I don't really have a dog in the fight of the Travis Kelsey Taylor Swift thing. I, uh, I guess I just hope they're happy and they uh, both seem like potentially nice people who also happen to be megastars and good for both of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's it's also been sort of an interesting time, though, too, because the industry is just starting to wake up now after the strikes. Just oh, yeah. really in the last couple of weeks, productions are you know being greenlit. Things are oh, yeah. starting to move. People are in prep, getting ready. I've had several clients who've been testing cameras and testing new things lately, which is a good sign for the future. I I find that when I'm on sets now, like people, like they don't mask at all. There'll be like one person who masks. It feels sort of like business as usual. And so far uh, I haven't seen any uh, mass die offs. So I think maybe we can safely say it's kind of, we're back to business as usual a little bit. 
a little bit. Yes, I think that it does feel pretty, you know, post pandemic feel now. It feels really like, you know, it, it's normal, more normal yeah. on set than it's ever been. Uh, but, you know, we were talking about the drop off that people keep talking about this drop off in production now post strikes saying we've reached peak TV. Peak TV is over. None of the streamers are going to be uh, producing at the same volume. You know, it, it's really interesting because even if that's true, if you go back 11 years, we were just talking about this before we started the show. Yeah. You know, House of Cards was like the first big, the first big series that Netflix produced. And yeah, I'd say like that in Orange is the New Black. Those are the, yeah, the, the, the those it was were, like because it, it was like a big deal that David Fincher and Kevin Spacey were doing a, a show for streaming. Like it was kind of a, it was a roll of the dice that no one had ever done before. I think it'd be interesting to look at how many production days and hours have increased since Netflix became a real force in the industry and how much more production Netflix is directly responsible for. Because I, I'm not saying that they would make up for the shortfall that might be happening across all of production from you know 11 years ago, but it's possible that the drop-off isn't going to be as grand as people are predicting because there is a lot more work, I think, just in general that has become the standard in the last few years. Well, but, so, but that's the thing is, is, I mean, it's like over the course of, you know, 11 years, people get inured to a certain amount of work going on. But I will say this, uh, most streaming streaming series have half or a third as many episodes as uh, an episodic series would on a network. So if you're if you're working on NCIS, there's like 22 episodes. So there might be as uh, might be as many as 20 four episodes in a season and most streaming shows have i mean Half like on, yeah. honestly yeah. Uh, true detective season four only has six episodes and this was one of the things that the writers guild kept talking about was like what do i do with the rest of my year how do i make a living how do i not you know drive for instacart uh, even though I'm a guild writer and I'm writing on primo television stuff, it's not enough money to support a family and, and, and a lifestyle in L.A. or even wherever you are. Because actually, thanks to the pandemic, you could be writing TV from it doesn't matter where you are. You could be in Bangalore as long as you have a good Internet connection. A lot of writers rooms are virtual now. You know. I think there's a lot more people who are actually working in the industry, too. I think there's been a big influx of people who've moved over to this space versus, you know, a little more than a decade ago. But I don't, I don't mean to bang on this drum because I know that this is something we talked about during the strikes a lot, is that I think that all the networks and everything are going to complain about the writers and the actors and, and, and say that they couldn't afford it. And that's why they had to cut production. But when you think about it, the writers are not the major expense of a TV series, uh, nor are the actors. There are probably more actors on a tv series well definitely more, more actors <laughs> you know definitely um, yeah. my dinner with andre the series yeah it's not you but um <laughs> but i think that the reason that a lot of the drop-off is going to happen first it, it has to do with interest rates going up and basically these networks were coasting on essentially free money because interest rates were so low they could just keep borrowing and borrowing and borrowing and they were all growth centric and when interest rates went up the investors in companies like netflix and Warner Brothers and whatnot were like, okay, well, now that you have had some growth, you've had many years, not just quarters, but years of growth, let's see some profit. And uh, these things hadn't been super profitable, even though, you know, Netflix has an obscene amount of subscribers. I don't know. I haven't checked to see the exact numbers lately, but because of that, the investors calling their, it's not calling their bluff, but basically saying like, we want to get paid now, now that this is like a real thing that everyone does. And uh, something I heard Craig Mays in an interview talk about was sort of the distorting effect that Netflix has had on the whole business, just because they started doing what they were doing. And you know, Disney, HBO, Amazon, all these people were like, well, I guess we're doing that now, too. And they all jumped into that business. And it was kind of unsustainable from a financial standpoint. I mean, I mocked it openly on here and I still mock it. To me, this is one of the most mockable things ever. But the Rings of Power was a billion dollar television season. Like, how do you oh, yeah. how do you even begin to make your money back on that? I mean, I can't help but think. What if Netflix did their own thing and nobody else followed? What if everyone stayed business as usual and decided they didn't want to go after that as like I mean, I think that they saw I think that they saw the writing on the wall, which was we're all kind of used to it. I mean, not not to get too deep of a cut here, but like in the Napster days when file trading first became like a thing, 
I, I think I wasn't alone in saying like, I would pay for this. Like this is a valuable service. And it wasn't too long before Apple came along with iTunes. And then later you get, end up with Spotify and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I even remember thinking at the time, like, I wish this was a subscription service. I would rather pay a monthly fee for music than have to like buy each individual song. And obviously my thought was not unique because it's not like Steve Jobs was like, huh? Yeah, rocks onto something there. That model became kind of prevalent. So I think I think that they saw the same thing, thing happening yeah, yeah, of with course. TV and movies. And But I, I don't know if it was actually the same. I think that, you know, the idea of music streaming and movie streaming are not 100% analogous. And I believe that if you were to not have anyone else in that space, people might subscribe to Netflix. And yes, there would be some people who would cut the cord. But for the most part, I think that everyone would still still have their terrestrial service because Netflix did not replace all the things that people would have wanted to. The industry cannibalized yeah. itself and started replacing all the things. Now sports is available. Well, on I mean, that's nine that's, different that's, streaming that's like platforms. the next frontier, I think, because I think that like live streaming content was like the last frontier for this because, yeah, you can, you know, buffer however many TV shows and movies on on some server farm somewhere and I can watch them on TV. But to have something happening live and I'm and I'm seeing a live telecast of it. And the first one I can remember, but maybe there are others, was Chris Rock's comedy concert last year. And that was a live comedy mm. concert and didn't wreck the servers. They didn't, you didn't hear horror stories about that. And now you're going to see WWE wrestling on Netflix. They just cut a humongous deal for that. You're going to see on Hulu and you're going to and you're going to see on Amazon. You're going to see all the sports. And when I feel like that was the final, the Apple well, and, TV and, too. and Disney yeah. owns ESPN and and like I think that they're still figuring out how they're going to make ESPN work in streaming, but they're going to figure it out and it's going to completely demolish linear cable. Like there will be no reason to stay on linear cable ever again. It's interesting though. What do you think happens with the, the indie film scene? Cause the indie film scene kind of goes through yeah. these weird, you know, cycles. Do you think that indie film and film think, festivals still film have a festivals, place? Or do you film think festivals, film festivals, I don't believe have really taken much of a hit over all this. I mean, I think that COVID gave them a bit of a hit, but there will forever be people who are making independent films and trying to get seen and trying to get people to watch them and realizing that film festivals are one route and, you know, especially the big ones like, you know, your Sundances and Tribeca's and South by Southwest, et cetera. Like, I feel like those end up being big events for tastemakers, for, you know, the people who go off and report about it. As a filmmaker, I will say it's the best way to connect with your audience. It's also the best way to connect with whatever journalists are covering, whatever kind of thing you're doing. And you're going to get way more coverage when uh, Warner Brothers saddled me with the dopey name of Alien Raiders for the feature I'd been working on, and I hated the title, one of the things I said was, can I take this on a festival run, knowing that if I showed up at a festival and met someone from the press or whatever, and they met me and they, there was like a face on this stupidly titled name, but they're like, eh, he seemed like an okay guy, which hopefully I pulled off a little bit. Ben he's, Rock. He's, he's not the okay. but like, <laughs> He's an okay guy. He's not the worst. Well, like, like we premiered at Fantastic Fest, which, in my opinion, is one of the best festivals, if not the best festival I've ever attended. It's 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 just such a great festival, and it's all genre stuff. And so at that festival, I met tons of people who specialize in genre coverage. That's all they that's all they do. And so I got some coverage out of that. And I remember sometime later, someone complaining that my movie was had been overhyped, and I was like. I'll take all the credit for that because Warner Brothers didn't really put a lot of <laughs> marketing money into it. They put banner ads on some websites. They hired a PR firm. They got me some interviews. They weren't bad, but like for the straight to video movies that were being made, you know, in the late aughts, which is when that was 2009, that's kind of what they would do for, for a movie like that. And you have to kind of go be the spokes model for your film and pound the pavement and film festivals, in my opinion, are the best place to do that. And, you know, I've been to a ton of them now. And even uh, when Bob DeRosa and I were doing 20 seconds to live, we discovered uh, web fest, which are film festivals that specialize in, in web series. 
And I really thought the first one I went to was Seattle Web Fest. And I was like, I walked in there with an attitude because we've all seen web series, especially you and I, you know, living in L.A. It's like every third person you knew five years ago, 10 years ago had a web series that they were, you know, filming on their phone and it wasn't very good. And, and I walked in with an attitude about like, I'm about to be the best thing anyone's ever seen. And then I was uh, pleasantly surprised the web series that were playing festivals, of course, have been curated like anything else at any other film festival. And by being curated, that meant that like the best of the best that were submitted got in. And so even the ones that were a little rough around the edges in one way or another didn't have like the highest top quality acting. You were you would still watch them and go like, oh, there's really something interesting here. And so, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll defend film festivals. I'll go down defending film festivals. I think that they're great showcases of your work. They're great places to meet other filmmakers. They're great places to meet other press. I don't know how we ended up talking about film festivals, but yay, film festivals. Well, I, I asked, then you give us a, a very <laughs> comprehensive answer. So. All right. Well, I, I think that about wraps us up. Can we get to the interview with Hoida? Let's get to the interview with Hoida. Let's do it. All right. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. Firstly, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, you're somebody who's been, we, we've been like, one day we could hopefully talk to Hoytema. Hoyt, we, we love your work so much over here. And it's so referenced, you know, from Let the Right One In, which I think is the, the first movie you shot that got decent distribution in America, all the way through, uh, God, uh, Ad Astra, Nope. There's so, so many of them. And then all of your collaborations with Christopher Nolan, which are, are legendary. We're, we're here to talk about Oppenheimer. Congratulations for being nominated for Best Cinematography. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it, amazing. Yes. When I saw the film, I was like, this is obviously, this is like the most obvious shoe in for Best Cinematography I've, I've ever seen. It's, it's so groundbreaking. I mean, I guess the, maybe the best place to start is sort of like when you and Christopher Nolan come onto a new project together, because now you've done four or five projects with him, mm. like everything since Interstellar. Was that the first one? Yeah, correct. Yeah. What are the conversations like? What's, what's the collaboration with him like? Because he seems like such a meticulous director. And we've had Wally Pfister on the show before, but like all of this large format, like I feel like it's like the ultimate dream big for a cinematographer, uh, all of these films that you've done with him. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely dream big, but it's also surprisingly small, I would say, you know? Mm. Well, this is a fourth film together. So I always have a feeling that our best prep is kind of, you know, our previous films. Uh, <laughs> and that's kind of the principle that we, we function very well with. We start every film sort of very carefully and we are not necessarily wasting too many words to it before we actually really start getting momentum to get into the material. And also, you know, we have spent in all these years, we've spent, you know, so many endless hours in scouting vans and on airplanes and on film sets. So, so we have done a lot of the talking, you know, and funny enough, you say Chris is a very meticulous filmmaker, but this process has also allowed us to be, I think, very intuitive and you know, we can, we can kind of skim through a lot of bullshit just, just by knowing each other so well after the, after all these years. Well, maybe talk about like when you first went to work with him, uh, again, it was on Interstellar. He, at that point he'd done, he'd done all the Dark Knight movies. He'd done Inception and stuff like that. Like, you know, he had a reputation that preceded him, but I also feel like so did you, you, you had done so many amazing looking films. What, what brought, uh, the two of you together for this collaboration? Yeah. Well, I had, I had never done anything on the scale that, that he had worked on. So, uh, it was pretty intimidating for me, you know, however, I very quickly realized, you know, that sort of my projection on what that scale is and what he did, uh, you know, it was very much sort of a result from step by step by step labor. When we started interstellar, I was, you know, literally looking up at that crazy gigantic mountain in front of me and thinking, <laughs> how am I going to do this and how. You know, how am I going to sort of, you know, even technically, you know, wrap my head around this, but you know, he, he was always very calm and very sort of reassuring. And he sort of said, you know, let's just start, let's just start with one step, you know, and, and then I one step, take another step. And, and before you know it, you're sort of engulfed in a lot of practicalities, a lot of practical problems, and you're trying to solve a lot of little things that you realize later are sort of becoming the sum of, you know, the bigger picture. And, 
and it hasn't been any different ever since in a way, you know, it's, it's intimidating, but I think somehow we, you, after you take one step, you know, every second step gets a little easier. Mm. If that makes yeah. sense. Well, and there's something I've always noticed about all of his films. And even as we've gotten into like these large format things that you've done with him, like Dunkirk. Well, I mean, I, I mm -hmm. think all the films that you've done with him have involved IMAX to some degree. Uh, yeah. And I, and I believe Oppenheimer is the one that involves it to the biggest. But there's e even when it's like big sci-fi, hard sci-fi, there's like a naturalism to the approach to the image to the lighting mm -hmm, uh yeah. the lensing the, i don't know if the right word is pragmatism but like it's this big story but it, it's being told in a way that just feels very much like you're right there with it mm -hmm. is there uh, a specific creative artistic approach that the two of you go at it with to kind of create that that look that feel i know that shooting celluloid is part of it but like what are the discussions what are the discussions about like if if one of you had an idea to, to go more expressionistic but again like i don't feel like his films are very expressionistic for the most part. No, I, I, you know, I always say that restraint is a very big, powerful tool, you know, that, that, yeah. that, that, that we use. Per design, our films are sort of put together very much out of taste. To a certain extent, we're both, you know, annoyingly puristic, you know, we love, <laughs> we, 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 we we both love very much, you know, the, the expression of celluloid, you know, the, the way it renders colors, uh, we both love the big format, the way it, it, it renders depth and, and perspective. So we, we have always sort of maybe in the beginning intuitively felt that, you know, very powerful affinity or, or magnetism towards that, that specific format. And it's, it's very interesting because we have always sort of tried to squeeze whatever subject matter we have in front of us, you know, to work for that format, just because, yeah, we always we always kind of believed that this was really, you know, the way to photograph things for us, you know? And so I'm trying to sometimes figure out why that is, but I think it has a lot to do with, with that idea that, that you have, a, that you have a format that reproduces things so faithfully to the way you, you yourself see the world that you just try to apply it to everything. Do you think IMAX sees resolution and like depth of field wise, more or less the way we see? Yeah. I mean, the, that's a difficult conversation because of course an, an, an IMAX camera doesn't see things the same as human eye sees and yeah. a human eye has a, has an extremely small chip to it. So, <laughs> uh, you know, de depth of field, et cetera, works, works, works very different than for instance, on, the, on an IMAX camera, um, you know, or the, you know, if you, if you project on a much bigger surface uh, yeah. area, but at the same time, you know, everything is an interpretation of course, and yeah. the, the perspective that we get as well as sort of the viscerality of an IMAX frame. But it, but in that way, we felt that sort of a naturalistic way of looking into a scene or looking into reality is very similar to, you know, what an IMAX camera does for us, as well as because of a shorter depth of field that gives us really that power and those tools to sort of control our perspective and control the depth very much. I think we should jump into uh, Oppenheimer. And I've got a question right off the bat here about the uh, sort of like the first, I mean, really, it probably goes on for about the first maybe 20 minutes of the movie. Uh, I was really taken by the cross cutting of the story between the main sort of storylines and also these moments, which might be considered expressionistic because, uh, or maybe some of the more expressionistic stuff, you have these macro sort of subatomic uh, particles spinning yeah. and exploding and colliding intercut with everything with, with, of course, like this very, la you know, sound up soundtrack. Uh, I know that from your collaborations, you like to try to create as much stuff in camera. Is that all CG? Is it, is there, are you guys I actually dropping like, uh, like gl <laughs> glitter inside of yeah. like uh, uh, glycerin and spinning it around in a, in a, yeah. in a, a test tube? I'm curious, uh, is it all in a computer? Is it, is, did you do some No, practical? I mean, I mean, the whole idea is that it, that, that is not CG, you know, um, and CG as computer generated images. Yeah. Um, we like to shoot, you know, even though it can be a visual effect, right? But we like to shoot all those elements in camera. So you always start with, with a, with a tangible object or uh, something you can see, uh, you can touch, or you can look at, and you can change your camera angle at, et cetera, et cetera. Now we film a lot of those and starting this whole process is like a big science project, you know, in, in, in high school or something, you know, we have a studio full of experiments and, and our visual effects supervisor, Andrew Jackson and Scott Fisher, special effects specialist, 
they keep designing all these little ways or science experiments in order to enable us to actually really film things, you know, very much in the, in the style of Douglas, the late Douglas Trumbull, you know, mm. who, who did it for, you know, Space Odyssey or for your Blade Runner. Where, where, they, where they would create all these miniatures and, and, and smoke effects and light effects and fire effects or zero gravity effects. So very much in that school, you know, they have been creating the, the visual effects as well, which basically means real physics apply to what you shoot. And those real physics, they, they translate very much into, you know, the final results or the final I images, which are very much, very often they're put together of different, different things or there's elements taken, et cetera, et cetera. But there's this, there had always been that will to sort of really film it and to really see it. Because if we really film it and really see it, we also, while we're shooting, we can project it. You know, we, we pr always project our days and our rushes. So we see it on the screen and we, we can respond on it and we can re reshoot stuff. We can do things a little differently or build something differently, you know, instead of like spinning ping pong balls, what if we use spinning glass balls and how look, how does that look? And <laughs> what if we... That's what if so we, cool. instead of, instead of, uh, you know, we have aquariums and we're pouring like, uh, aluminum particles in there that, that reflect the light that we shine into it and then stir it. And then we play with lighting in order to get different lighting effects. And this gives, gives us universes or electrons or stars, uh, you know, and there's this endless experimentation. What if we use instead of aluminum, what, what if we use, uh, use magnesium powder? What if we use this? What if, and, and, and so there's, there's this constant experimentation going on, you know, in order to sort of put a face to the physics, you know, it's not always about, about being accurate, but it's about creating sort of examples that we can understand and we can grasp or grapple the, the physics behind it, you know, and, and they're always based, ba based on real physics, but, uh, but it just, it was very helpful to us to start from a tangible base opposed to dream it up put it in a computer and, and design, design something from scratch, you know? I, I think that, uh, when, when people think about, you know, cinematography and the work of cinematographers, I, th I think it's almost always about like big set pieces or explosions or dramatic mm -hmm. dramatism with, uh, with actors. But I felt like you guys must've spent days shooting the fish tank, shooting the insert shots, shooting the, the close-ups. I think that's a yeah, part but, of the, the job that doesn't get uh, talked about very much. Is that as fun and rewarding as the big set pieces? How much do you, do you like these, these sort of days? Well, it's the most fun, but I also have to tell you that the amount of elements that are being shot there are tirelessly done by Scott and Andrew while we're shooting other things as well. So we constantly have this set that travels simultaneously with us, which is basically a home built studio. It's like a, like a tent or a garage, uh, uh, you know, and they are just all day, every day, they're doing all these experiments and things. And Chris and I are like, you know, during lunch or when we have a little bit of time, we go by and we, we look at it or we tweak or we get impressed and we play around with that. And then the next day we, we all watch that stuff on the screen and then we, we respond, we change and you know, but. But it is, it is a total playground. It's like, uh, it's this wonderful sort of, you know, Leonardo da Vinci studio where everything is possible. And it's like oh, a weird so cool. combination of expressionistic art, uh, as well as, you know, pure physics, et cetera, et cetera. And, and mechanics, a lot of mechanics, you know, like Scott Fisher built all these weird devices, you know, which is basically, I mean, like build a device that is a, is a motor that has a, a disc on it. And on this disc is, is, is metal pins. And at the end of these metal pins, there's ping pong balls and these ping pong balls swirl very hard. And we notice that if you move the disc, you get oscillation at the dead direction. And if we then expose this with longer shutter times, you know, you get stripes and you get, you get, you know, you get, you get a very nice representation of, for instance, electrons speeding around in circles or, you know, that leading us again to, you know, maybe this is a good vis visualization of electrons in a particle accelerator, for instance, you know, and how well would it look if they collide into each other and, you know, what are we going to shoot then? And, you know, it's, it's an ongoing, you know, ongoing science project. I feel like uh, in a weird way, you know, like Christopher Nolan, I think, uh, well, you and Christopher Nolan in, with um, Interstellar showed a black hole more realistically than it had ever been shown in a movie. And now you're showing us, 
you know, uh, subatomic, you know, quantum particles in a way that no one's ever, uh, ever, ever shown us. And I, and I even think a little bit, there's like a shot kind of early in the movie, I guess, where uh, Oppenheimer's laying on his bed and we see the electrons or mm-hmm. whatever. Mm-hmm. I don't know what particles. Quarks. Well, I'll go with quarks whipping around in front of him. Now, was that like a, mm-hmm. did the special effects guys, had, had they figured out some of the stuff or like at that point, were you, were you like saying like, Hey, we need something that can whip around. Or was that purely just like lighting saying like, you know, I, I don't know what fiber optics or whatever you were using to create that effect. Uh, well, in this particular effect, I think we're talking ping pong balls on, a, on, a, on metal wire uh, really? rotating. And, and, uh, or, or t- tiny white balls, but, but th- this, I remember this was a result from, we had, before we started the film, we had like a, a, a two or three days testing period. And, and there was, of course, in the script, there were all these sort of little, you know, physics visions, you know, Oppenheimer's, uh, view on the very fabric of physics and, you know, and of forces, uh, we had every sort of scientific probe lenses, macro lenses, we, 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 we shot a Vista vision. We shot super high speed. We shot 35 millimeter. We shot 65 millimeter. We shot IMAX as well as, you know, we started to play around with, with shutter angles, uh, speed of shooting, you know, it's almost some things are almost like step motion animated or, you know, shot three frames per second. If somebody lays very really still and you shoot things three frames a second, then it rotates very hard. How will it look later and, and what will it do to your image? So that, that, that specific thing you're talking about, that was kind of something that we learned d- during those testing days and something that then we, we took that apparatus into, into the room where it was. And we just did a few, few, few experimental shots like that, you know. So I, I'm burning to ask you a question, and, and I know this is something that has been much discussed about Oppenheimer, but for this, the choice was made to shoot IMAX, and the choice was made to shoot like the congressional hearing stuff with Robert Downey Jr., that whole plot in black and white, but black and white IMAX did not exist. You guys no. brought it into existence. Can you t- I don't know that we've ever talked to someone who compelled Kodak to create a new film stock that never existed before. Yeah, I mean, let me start off by saying that, uh, you know, with uh, obsession and enough enthusiasm, all these companies that are catering for us, I'm talking like Panavision or Kodak or IMAX, you know, they're all sort of sitting on the edges of their seats in order to build us something new. It's it's very often it's just asking the right questions, you know. It's not even, a, not even purely just a matter of money, you know. It's that kind of engineering willingness to in order to build stuff to to see things that you haven't seen before. But I mean, Kodak was, was super willing to help us out. The good news is, is that yes, we want to shoot on IMAX. We were also shot shooting on five per 65 and thank God the film stock that goes into an IMAX camera is the same as that goes in a five per IMAX camera. It's 65 millimeter film basically. But no, it didn't exist for either of those cameras. So Kodak had to manufacture it. And we, we initially thought, oh, this is going to be simple and fun. And they're just going to <laughs> smear a specific, specific emulsion on, on top of a film. And, and then we roll it through the camera and Photocam develops it and it's going to look great, you know, but it was, it, it, it turned out to be a much bigger sort of venture for us. It was, it was much more complex than that because, you know, the backing of the, ca- of the film stock is different. So automatically, you know, the film gates that you have in an IMAX camera or a 65 millimeter camera didn't work because they started reflecting uh, spill light back on the film. So, so we had to re-engineer the gates of the cameras, uh, as well as the lab. We thought, you know, as they have only one 65 millimeter pipeline, uh, they had to figure out how could they change oh. from color to, to black and white totally and back again. Totally different chemistry so, and everything, totally different so process. Totally different chemistry, totally different process. So they, they, they literally have like a, a big, uh, you know, like a magazine or storage space downstairs where they had to install gigantic tanks in which they could drain the machines and then switch over to other chemicals and fill their machines. And then every time we wanted to change in between color and black and white, it was like a three day period in which they had to recalibrate their machines and, and retest, retest it, et cetera, et cetera. So, so in the end, it was, it was not just Kodak making the film, it became this kind of group mm. effort of all these different departments sort of, you know, uh, putting this together for us just because of the, 
couple of crazy lines in the script and, and, some, <laughs> and some weird ideas. But uh, I just recall very much when Chris and I, for the first time, did some tests on black and white and we had our equipment pretty, pretty good together. I mean, there were still small things that really needed improvement, but we shot a portrait of Killian. You know, uh, we just on the IMAX camera, we shot a portrait for the first time, a portrait on, on, on that format on film. And, and that format is very similar to like a medium format photo camera, you know, like an yeah. old Hasselblad or something. And we saw that result back and we were just both blown away because you, you, you never really on a screen like that had seen a portrait with that kind of depth or that kind of, you know black and white rendition, you know, it's, it, 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 it was amazing for us. You know, we took that negative and, uh, because we liked so much, we just wanted to hang, you know, hang that in our, in our, <laughs> in, in our offices. So I had, I had a guy that could make extremely good scans from an IMAX uh, frame and we had a print made that was pretty big and that, that became one of the prints that Chris used in the early sort of publicity for the film, you know, when it wasn't known that. Killy was going to play Oppenheimer, you know, that's the print that came out through a lot of these outlets, which, which is literally a, a scanned frame from a strip of IMAX film, you know, from a stri strip of moving IMAX film. And it looked amazing. <laughs> it does look amazing. Um, and it's interesting because like when I think about IMAX, especially IMAX used for narrative filmmaking, I actually, the first thing I think of is Dunkirk, which you also shot and just mm -hmm. like these amazing vistas that you create. But I feel like I've never seen an IMAX film that went so tight, like, you know, like a, a lot of, I mean, you've got big vistas, you know, at, at the Trinity site and stuff like that. There's, pl there's yeah. plenty of large stuff, but there's also some real intimacy and it, it almost reminds me a little bit of uh, The Hateful Eight, the Tarantino movie where they used 70 millimeter, but they told, you know, it wasn't Lawrence of Arabia. It was like almost all contained. And with this, mm -hmm. th there's a similar thing where you're using the large format to get more intimate. Can you talk about that mm -hmm. approach? Yeah, I, Chris and I had to decide that our vistas in this film or, or, or our scope is, is, is not something that, that comes from, you know, landscapes or whiteness or action, but it comes from, it has to come from faces, you know? I always say that the faces kind of became our landscapes. Hmm. And I think scope is, scope, scope is, a, is, a, is an interesting thing because you can look at it and it's wide and it's big, but I, I also believe that scope is something that comes from what you as an audience project onto something, you know? I think, uh, you know, the, the human eyes are extremely interesting because it's not what they purely express, but when you look into somebody's eyes, what you also see is all the endless possibilities of what, what somebody is thinking, you know, there's the fascination of what's happening behind somebody's eyes inside his mind as well. And that's something what, what a close-up very much has that kind of power to not only show expression, but also have an, have an audience read their own things into those, into those eyes or into those faces. And I think for us, it was very much, it was very obvious and important that our film had to play very much on that level, you know, we're dealing with a lot of very abstract concepts like quantum physics or quantum mechanics that very little people sort of have the ability to understand. And even I, we cannot grapple the concepts of quantum physics. Yet at the same time, when you look at Oppenheimer, you have to kind of feel that you have some sort of access to that and that, that, that you understand that he does understand that. So, so I think you're, you're automatically reading a lot of scope into somebody's face. So, so that has been very important. And that has been also very important with how we chose to be, you know, closer or wider to those faces and how we look at those faces and what do we see in people's eyes. It's not so much, you know, just a face talking. So in that way, you know, for me, a face, a face is a landscape and, and a face is scope at the same, a face can be scope at the same time. It can, it can be gigantic and it can be intimate and it can be small, but, but, but I, I understood that in this film, we, we could not rely on sort of a classic sort of dynamics that you have in films, right? You got to close up and then you cut to a wide shot, then you get to breathe and then you go in there again and then it gets intense. You go a little bit closer, you go a little bit wider. <laughs> Somehow we had to find a, a new dynamic in this film that would work for us as an audience, you know? Uh, there, there's a line in the movie. I believe it's Matt Damon who says that uh, this is the most 
the most important fucking thing in the whole world or something to something to that yeah, effect. Yeah, yeah. And there's not too many movies out there that I, I feel like really cause the audience. And because like you hear we're, we're you know, many, many years removed from uh, you know, 70 plus years removed from the events of Los Alamos. And I think there's a lot of people who don't understand necessarily just how important this was for the whole world. Uh, Both of my grandfathers worked on the Manhattan Project. One of them was Mm -hmm. out at Los Alamos. And I know that there was a lot of, you know, it's a Christopher Nolan movie. I, I mean, it's there's a lot of intention to try to get it right, to tell the story right, mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. go to the actual places. Was was there a sense of importance every day going into set, every day going into this job, like of, of what you're doing is you were creating a, a work of fiction, but there was really a sense of importance to get this right and get this right, not just in a, in a uh, you know, a typical way you have to make your day and you have to do the job. But was there an, an overwhelming sense of importance in the story that you were you were telling and how this was all going to, together? I mean, the sense of importance was very much there when you read the script, and and I understood straight away that Chris was trying to tell a very big story, a very complex story, very ambiguous story filled with doubt and and ambiguity, and you know we always approach things the best to our ability. You know what I mean? It's like you know one of the reasons that we want to throw the biggest formats uh, against it has also very much to do with this kind of respect for the subject matter. Uh, and in the end, you always want to, you want to tell something specific and it can be something very big or something very small, but, but you always want to tell it in the, the best way you can and have, have the right integrity and, and try to be as pure as possible. And that's also, again, where that restraint comes back, right? You, you don't want to sort of be too obvious and too cheap with the way you chase effect or the way you just be pompous or big or, or small, you, you want to handle every subject with care and you want to be truthful and you want, you don't want to sort of alienate your audiences by bad trickery. And, and I think with this subject matter, of course, we were all very much under impression and in all, we all understood sort of the complexity of the, the materials. We all read the book, of course, up front, 700 pages transcript, uh, oh, American wow. Prometheus. It's one of the sort of most rich, you know, bodies of work is it's very rich and it's so full of information. And then Chris has created this script out of it that, that sort of, you know, boiled down the, the essence of that work, but yeah, it's, it's very serious, but within that stuff, of course, it's also very important to, to be yourself within that and to find yourself and to, you know, be the person who you are, be a human being. And I think that by having done these these things together we i have a feeling that we always also can gauge that very much not about being getting to work every day and and getting nervous and saying oh we're <laughs> so impressed and we have to we have to do this right i think doing it right is also you know staying true to yourself and so that is very much sort of the atmosphere on set and we can do very difficult things and we can still keep things light as well at the same time you know it's in a way what do you think is the best creative process for yourself and your crew and everybody around. And, and I think somehow we all feel free and we all feel that our sort of judgment channels are wide open when we do it. And we also, we all have a wonderful time and we all love what we're doing and we're all super inspired and we're all privileged that we get to play on that playground, you know? Man, I think I, I can't think of a better place to end it, and and our time is basically up. Uh, we would uh, love to have you come back on the show at some point to talk about the rest of your career because there's so much stuff that, uh, like, I, like I said before we even started, I feel like I could do two hours on "Let the Right One In" alone. I've seen that movie dozens of times. Um, well, why don't you invite me to a, 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 a podcast at some point? In the, uh, I also I love talking when I can talk a little slower and when I can think about shit a little lower yeah (laughs) yeah and also you know i i truly believe that like process of filmmaking is just is not always possible to capture in uh easy sound bites you know for for me it's always a very sort of long and thoughtful process but it's i i often say it's just a longer conversation you know Mm. (laughs) you can keep talking about this stuff no, it's what we love. It's why we do this. Yeah. Uh, well, well, Hoida, thank you very, very much uh, for your time. And hopefully we can have you back on because, I'd, again, I'd love to dive into into your uh, just absolutely rich and wonderful filmography. Before we get going, uh, I mean, if people want to 
anyone who's listening to this who hasn't seen Oppenheimer, uh, I'd be I'd be pretty shocked if any of our listeners haven't seen Oppenheimer. So, well, maybe after the award season uh, calms down, we can have you back on at some point. But uh, again, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I would wish you good luck, but I don't think you need <laughs> any any good wishes from me. I I, uh, I have a good feeling. That that film might go uh, somewhere. <laughs> like, thank uh, you very much. But, but you know, uh, yeah, we got our fingers crossed for you. It's, the by the way, it's it's important to remember uh, that making good movies is not a winners and losers game. Agreed. Yeah, hundred percent. Thank you, Hoida. It, it was a dream to talk to you, and we really appreciate your time. All right, so that was Hoida von Hoidema. I am uh, seriously hoping that we can bring him back on and do kind of a career retrospective with him because. Uh, as much as I love Oppenheimer, there's so much more I want to talk to him about. Uh, his, his work is great, but obviously we're going to let him get through award season. And we're going to have Janelle Riley from Variety uh, come on and do our annual uh, Oscars roundup uh, here in a few weeks. But uh, I'd say Hoyda is probably the odds on favorite to win. But uh, I don't know. It's a tough category. <laughs> like, I, I feel like 2023 is one of the best movie years in, in memory. For, for sure. And uh, great movies. Great, great movies this year. And now, short ends. So, Ben, it is our short end time of the show. It's a time when you and I kind of uh, get on our own personal soapbox about whatever we might be interested in in yeah. this week. Uh, what do you got? What do, What are you interested in? I have a really cool YouTube channel that I think our listeners will dig. And you, this is uh, oh. props. <laughs> no pun intended, to the YouTube algorithm for serving this up to me. But like sometimes with YouTube, I'll find that it's like I'm falling down the same rabbit hole over and over again. And it's a channel called Scott Prop and Roll. And it is hosted by... Uh, and is it Scott Prop and Roll and yeah. puns? I mean, because oh, that's like... this guy's full of dad jokes. You'll love it. No, no, you should uh, check it out. Okay. Um, I approve. Yeah. And he has a lot of shorts on YouTube. You know, people have the shorts that are like, you know, mm. vertical video usually. And they're like, you know, 30 seconds or a minute or so. And he goes into a lot of explanation about how various props are made, weapon props, y you name it. And it's really interesting. And he definitely knows what he's talking about. And then he'll also do these longer videos, 16 by 9, the way it should be with other prop masters and they'll talk about props in movies and they'll do like prop guys react uh, it's like prop guys react to movie mistakes but i feel like if you are as i am like i mean i i, I came out of the art department i you know like the two departments i was in before i i made the big move to directing uh were makeup and art department and it's just uh great to hear these guys talk about their craft and he's just uh, deeply knowledgeable and very funny and entertaining and, yes, indeed, full of uh, dad jokes. And uh, I think anyone who kind of likes what we're talking about will find him extraordinarily interesting. So check it out. Scott Prop and Roll. I, I, find, I find that stuff fascinating. I'll totally check it out. Uh, I don't know if you've ever run into Peter Geyer. He makes action props. These are props that, you know, uh, actors very much have an interaction with and might get, uh, you know, potentially like safely giving people dangerous things to interact nice. with. Like he makes razor wire prop razor wire it's all made out of like foam but the stuff looks so good on camera it looks like razor wire but you can have an actor fall right in it and they'll be totally fine it's yeah, he, even, like, he did yeah. one recently where it was talking about making fake meat for vegans if they have a scene where they have to eat a steak oh wow and and he showed mushrooms uh, yeah he showed one that somebody had made out of wax and he's like i'm still trying to figure out how they did this because it looked for all the world, like the world's juiciest steak, and he, and it had like no actual meat in it at all. I, I, again, I just find it endlessly fascinating. And one of the things I actually learned from this, but a guy I went to friggin' film school with, Guillaume Delouche, he was shouting out the prop masters on the uh, Oscar-nominated uh, production design films. And Guillaume Delouche, who I went to college with, was the prop master on uh, friggin' Oppenheimer. Oh wow. Yeah, nice. it's an Oppen Oppenheimer-y kind of, kind of episode here. But, you know, like I knew Guillaume and his wife, uh, Wendy, uh, who is a script supervisor. Uh, I knew them both really well 30 years ago because I'm, I'm an old. <laughs> but, you know, that's what happens in this business. You know, you meet a bunch of people and time goes by and a lot of people stick around. And the ones who are successful, it's kind of like, oh, you know, you, you get to socialize every once in a while and compare notes about, you know, their career. The fact that yeah. you're just still in the business is, is a thing. So, yeah. Hasn't killed me yet. So, Ilya, <laughs> what is your short end this week? 
Well, I'm very pleased that HBO Max, or just Max for all of you people who just yeah. signed up for the first time. You know, uh, you know, calling it Max is like calling Twitter X. I just can't, I can't make myself do it. I'll probably get there at some point. I'm probably going to have to. But yes, yeah, so mm. Max has uh, brought back Tokyo Vice. Tokyo Vice season two. Uh, there's only two episodes in. So if you haven't seen it, you can totally go back and watch season one. And then you've got two episodes of season two you can plow into. It's really good. It's a great series. Uh, I'm not going to totally uh, redo everything from what I said before, but after two more episodes, I'm still as hooked as ever. They were able to absolutely match the, the quality from season one. So if you haven't seen Tokyo Vice, check it out on Max, Tokyo Vice season two. It's great. And Michael, Michael Mann makes that show, right? He might have a credit because of the original Miami Vice, but uh, no. J.T. Rogers. It's created oh. by J.T. Rogers, and it's based on the book by Jake Adelstein. And yeah, it's uh, it's it's really good. Fun. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet, not even with your uh, glowing uh, recommendation last year. So I definitely need to check it out. I feel like I've been uh, mostly uh, consumed with True Detective Night Country. Yeah, that's been good, too. Yeah, oh, for sure. It's, it's pretty good. I mean, like, honestly, like, you know, in talking about peak TV, like, I feel like there's a lot of really good TV right now. And some of it's because the strike's over and the stuff that was in the pipelines coming out, the stuff that was shot before the strike is coming out. Also, like Jon Stewart back on The Daily Show, which I watched the first episode of right before we recorded. And it's like, holy crap, Jon Stewart back on The Daily Show feels like a warm blanket. You know, I got to say, cream always rises like good stuff does get out there. Good stuff does get seen. And uh, when big companies make good stuff, it's it's really, it, you know, it, it's got a huge reach. And I'm really glad that those series, some series in particular have come back and are really killing it. I'm still mourning uh, winning time a bit. I think winning time mm. was uh, was HBO really had all the makings of being this incredible, diverse, uh, different sort of voice network series streamer whatever you want to call it but holy crap they had so much good stuff sort of all happening at once and yeah now it's now it's weird now max is like a, it's a different thing it's not you know it's not the same it's kind of same a, it's kind yeah. of a dog's breakfast isn't it yeah there's there's a there's a little bit of everything in there some of it's really good some of it's kind of i don't know so yeah i know it's it, well it's very different genres it's beca yeah. it's really similar to netflix so not surprising that they're selling their stuff to netflix now too well so, it's weird yeah. to mush discovery channel stuff in with hbo stuff and now it's like hard to tell who's with what you yeah, know I'm, i keep all... want, expecting that i'm going to turn on hbo max one of these days and it's all going to be shark week like everything's going to be sharks and That's i haven't so seen funny. that yet but i, I half expect well, they, that could, to happen. they could get like well i mean they could have you know uh jaws and uh deep blue sea and you know like big blockbuster uh shark movies those are probably the only two that come to mind shark nato well and also like warner brothers dropping uh acme uh, coyote versus acme and like they're just gonna never release this movie Wow. And and yeah. uh, it's like such a weird move. It's the second time they've done it with a big multi-million dollar, you know, tens of millions of dollars that they're just lighting on fire because they don't like the movie. And I'm like, can you do that? They're like calling it a tax write-off. And a couple of people have said, well, if it's tax write-off, that means that the taxpayers are basically taking are paying for this movie. So you should just release it for us to us for free now. Like you should just give us Batgirl and Coyote versus Acme. All right. So, Ben, I think that's just about going to do it for this week. Where can people find you? They want to find uh, you outside of the show. Please go to BenRock.com. Uh, check check out BenRock.com. You can see my socials. You can uh, watch my reel, read my story, watch some interviews with me, see some of my corporate work. Holy crap. I'll, I'll waste at least 15, 20 minutes of your time. Uh, Ilya, where can people find you? Hot Red Cameras, hotredcameras.com. You can also find me on Instagram. Instagram's a place. Yeah, I'm there, at Ilya yeah. Friedman. So, yeah. It's just a matter out. of time before we're on TikTok, isn't it? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> matter of time. <laughs> All right, Ben, who do we have to thank for the show today? I mean, as always, Alana Cody, who is uh, doing her damnedest, working really hard to get us, uh, I think we might get all of the Oscar nominees for the Best Cinematography, which has never happened before, and it's all because of her. Uh, we'd also like to thank Ben Katz, who, uh, thanks to some technical problems with my camera, is probably uh, cursing my name and wishing I was never born right about now, but thank you, Ben Katz. We love you. We love everything you do. He edits this show and makes us sound like not idiots. And, and apparently look like not idiots. Yeah. 
Big love. Big. <laughs> I, am I doing yeah. it right? Big love to know. Ben Katz. Yeah. yeah. And last but never least, massive thanks to uh, Kay's Alatraxi. Uh, go to musicbykays.com. Kay's created all the music that you've heard on the show and so much more music because he is a very accomplished composer. And uh, you should hire him to compose music for your next film. And uh, he's just a heck of a guy. Awesome. So, Ilya, well would you like to take us out? Thanks for being here. Whoa. Yeah, that's... I, I is that different? Is that, it's get, that it's, get, it's getting there. It's getting there. All right. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.